us get ourselves started. Welcome to CEE 120E, 120C, 220C, gee, come on after a rough start. Um, for winter quarter of 2016, um, this is a class all about uh, what parametric design and optimization, and got a lot of good stuff kind of planned for this quarter, but today we're gonna spend a lot of time just explaining sort of about the, the structure of the class and give you a sense of really what it's all about. So if you're shopping around and trying to figure out if this is a good fit for what you're up to, Hopefully, uh, you'll leave today with a, a good sense of whether this is something that you want. Um, <coughs> my name is Glenn Katz. I think I know most of you. I had almost everyone in the class before, but a couple of new faces in there, and I'll enjoy meeting you too, kind of shortly. Um, most people will tell you I'm a very informal person, so you can at any point just jump in and wave and say stop and call me over and all that kind of stuff. That's really just the nature of what we do in a lot of the BIM classes. So, you know, I always intend to and try to treat everyone as colleagues. You know, we're all just in this together. I've been doing it for a while. You're kind of learning and developing your own sorts of expertise that complement what I do. In a lot of ways, you're better at doing a lot of things than what I do. And it's, it's just a mix. We're just a bunch of colleagues out in here working on something together. And in this case, working on what is, what I think is kind of one of the leading edge areas of where all this building modeling technology is being applied. And that's towards thinking about kind of parametric design and how we can optimize our designs using some scripting tools, heading towards generative designs, which is very different than what we've been doing typically if you start out in uh, 220A or one of the introductory classes. Okay, so I'm gonna sort of flip it around a little bit today and start with telling you some of the whys, then we'll get into the hows. I'll probably start with the syllabus and all that kind of stuff, but let me give you a sense of where we're going and why we're going there, and then we'll get back into the logistics. Okay. It's, somehow makes more sense to do it that way. So in terms of why, let's think about this. At a high level, there's this whole notion that the AEC industry is just really radically transforming itself right now, and that all this computing power and technology is really you know, moving past some tipping point. A lot of what we've been doing with the technology in the past many years has been automating or just augmenting what we've been doing in the past. You know, we've been sort of replacing some things, finding more efficient ways of doing it, just making it a little bit faster, maybe doing some new things around the edges that we couldn't do before. But we haven't necessarily necessarily transformed the way we approach the whole process of design. And what this class is all about is really where that is going in terms of starting to fundamentally transform things. So for me, it's kind of very exciting as a way of thinking about design and really where it starts with is this whole notion of contrasting what we have traditionally done with what we can start doing now with a lot of computational power. Okay. In the past, you know, and really what we have been doing mostly if you've been taking the BIM classes uh, along the way, is you've been explicitly designing things. Okay. And explicitly designing things is kind of okay. You know, by explicitly designing things, I mean that basically you know, you decide that you want to, once you're designing the building, I'm gonna put a wall in this location, you get the wall tool, you drag the wall tool up, you set the height, you set the width, you set all these different parameters about it, and you're very much in control of what's going on. And as you go through and put things down, you know, you're actually sort of saying, I want it at this precise location. But once that wall is at that location, it doesn't really know much about why it's there or why you made the design decisions to kind of make the decision that you made at that one time, it just sort of knows what it is, okay? It doesn't really have much intelligence about what's going on. It's kind of smart, but it doesn't really have your design intent encoded. And as we go through and explicitly design things, the nice thing is you have incredible freedom. As you sort of learn with a tool like Revit or something like that, you can really design most anything you want to, okay? But along the way, you also pick up an awful lot of responsibility for what you do, because you can combine all those different elements together and it's up to you to sort of figure out really whether it makes sense, whether you're meeting all the different criteria and objectives that you want to be doing with it. So, you know, there's kind of a trade-off in all that. You have incredible freedom, incredible flexibility, but also, you know, there's really not a whole lot of internal self-checking about whether the design makes sense. If it makes sense to you, it was kind of good enough. The disadvantage of doing it this way is that it's kind of slow and tedious. So if you've ever done a building of any large size, you know, when you were working on either the engineering student commons or maybe when you were working on the project for the shopping center, some of the different projects we've worked on, or even if you've been working on your, uh, your uh, global AEC buildings, <coughs> things like that, 
you, know, you make all these design <coughs> decisions and you make them explicitly, but it's an awful lot of work to the extent that you may be somewhat hesitant to go ahead and remake decisions because after you've kind of moved on down the garden path and continued adding detail and adding more detail to your building, you're sometimes hesitant to go back and make some changes early on because it's just an awful lot of work. You know, so many things when we do them very explicitly and you finely tune everything like a little jeweled box, it's almost so precious that you're afraid to kind of start flexing it and breaking it because it just fits together so, so finely. As we start moving towards the idea of parametric design, we're gonna try and break you free of that notion though. Okay, and really here's the idea behind parametric design. What we really wanna do, starting with thinking how it's different, is start thinking about rather than going through and having a lot of explicit decisions and encoding them, actually thinking about why you made that decision and embedding your intent, embedding the intelligence behind what you were after as opposed to the actual decision. Okay. So people, we tend to like to understand and embed the idea of why you made the decision rather than the actual decision, because conditions change. And if the context changes, you might make a different decision tomorrow. If materials weren't as available, if costs were different, if labor was different, if we moved the building from beautiful Northern California to some very hot or very cold climate, you might want to make a very different decision based on those local contexts, and it'd be nice if we could actually encode the intelligence so that the building could adapt itself, okay, based on opportunistically the site context and conditions, the local conditions, just really be more of a dynamic design <laughs> as opposed to being a very explicitly uh, controlled design. So, you know, one big concern that really we're getting into a lot when we start thinking about fabrication is the manufacturability of things. There's a lot of things we can be considering. We have different criteria. But the idea is, can we actually think about really your design intent and encoding that as opposed to the explicit decision you're making? Okay, as we go this way, the idea is that we're starting to start thinking about a framework for how we organize and think about our design, given the, given the notion that there are some parameters, which are things that are variables which you do change and tweak. There's other things which are results of those decisions. Okay? And you actually start to want, want to start being explicit in your own mind about thinking about which is which, which is really a design variable that you're changing versus really what's an evaluation of that design variable. But we'll come through some examples of where that goes and how we can apply that. Um, this is basic ability to iterate through design options. If we're gonna go through and parameterize parameterize our design, we now have the uh, ability to rapidly go through and automate the creation of a lot of different design alternatives and options that sort of tweak those different parameters. Test those, really finding out uh, you know, which of the parameters make the biggest in impact on the things that we care the most about, okay? And just really you know, use the machine automation to go through and iterate and generate a lot of those alternatives and give us feedback that we can then really go through and evaluate and use that feedback to uh, like uh, guide our further exploration. So the idea is along the way, we're gonna be evaluating designs. We'll be sort of, sort of encoding intent, we'll be creating alternatives, and then evaluating them based on different criteria. And this is where it really gets sort of interesting in terms of thinking about optimization, is that at some level, depending upon what criteria you're using, almost any decision can look good. Or maybe the better way to express that is that there's really very few absolutely good decisions. Okay, there's a whole host of good decisions based upon what criteria you're using and how you want to prioritize them. Okay, and we'll start thinking about it that way, that there's not a sort of a single design solution, but there's really a whole space of design solutions that we can prioritize and choose really where we want to be based upon what we're trying to, try to, trying to optimize. So we can look at that architecturally in terms of the aesthetics. We can look at it in terms of, oh, the solar performance. We can look at it in terms of using the wind, lead criteria. We can look at our designs in terms of their structural performance, just really thinking about, are we trying to minimize the size and weight, or are we more concerned about the sway or some sort of structural performance, okay, or the cost? You know, springing this to questions, a lot of things we can think about. Yeah. Other people will look at our designs and you'll want to go through and optimize the constructability. So whether that's the time it's going to take to go through and construct it or the cost, or if we're going to try and minimize clashes, 
or what are we going to think about trying to maximize the pre-manufacturability of things as opposed to kind of doing things uh, stick framed out in the field. There's a lot of different ways we can go. We can monitor, you know, optimize all these different things about design, about the construction process, but also even the operational performance. You know, this whole notion that what we do as designers is really a very small portion of the total impact of the designs we create that really ultimately, if that building's going to be out there operating for 50 or 100 years or even longer, that all sorts of design decisions we make today ultimately impact these factors. And, you know, quite often, you know, it's a very valid trade-off that you can say, we're going to build something that's going to cost more today, but actually lead to a much greater operating efficiency over the next 100 years. And, you know, there's no good or bad there. It's just two different ways of looking at it. It depends on what you're trying to optimize and really who your stakeholder is and what they're trying to optimize, because you're going to find out that everyone involved in the process has a slightly different thing they want out of it. Some people want to maximize um, the money they get out of the process immediately. Some people want to minimize their liability. Some people want to sort of uh, minimize their risk over the long time or uh, minimize the operating cost over the long time. Everyone sort of has different ways of looking at it. <coughs> so it all starts with encoding and thinking very explicitly about your criteria are, you know, going through a lot of alternatives, figuring out which criteria you're going to use. And here's where the real kind of funny rub comes to the whole thing. It's that when it comes to really choosing or deciding what's optimal, you know, the notion of what you choose to measure and what you define as your criteria is probably the most important thing. Because depending on what you choose to measure, if we're optimizing towards that, you'll get very different results. Okay, so very critical step. But the idea is at the end, hopefully, we're going to get some feedback that's going to guide further exploration so that we can kind of just keep on going. We have a, you know, it's, it's a, think of designs as being live and that uh, you can kind of keep on optimizing, uh, <coughs> keep on enhancing them iteratively, you know, just based upon the changing conditions. Okay, as we think about optimizing, there's a couple of different ways we can approach this. Just as a high level, we're going to explore, oh, this, this whole notion of single dimensional optimization. Single dimensional optimization is actually relatively easy in the scheme of things. If you give me one criteria and you say maximize or minimize that one criteria, I'll probably come to an answer. And there probably is a right answer for a single criteria. Okay. Multidimensional gets much more interesting because all of a sudden now we have trade-offs between different things. Okay. And if I'm trying to optimize the structural stability, that might be working against the cost, you know, or vice versa. Yeah, it's like multidimensional throws everything into a slightly different territory where when we start thinking about you know, multidimensional, often there's not a single answer. There's really a whole range of different answers, which leads to this whole notion of there being different frontiers where different things sort of make sense or don't make sense. Let me see if I can kind of actually motivate that with an example, just to give you a sense. Mm -hmm. Let's do this. I'm going to bring up this. Okay, do a little drawing. Thought I was drawing. There we go. Everyone has seen some sort of curve that looks like this. Okay. One of the classics when we think about optimization or just really making trade-offs is time versus cost. There's almost always a trade-off there. there. There's almost a universal truth that makes sense. So if we were thinking about building a building, if we were thinking about building the Y2E2 building, for example, and I think about the overall scale of, uh, you know, the building like this, you know, we can sort of, I can ask you today, now really, you, what do you think both the time and cost of building something like the Y2E2 building would be? And maybe that's too big. Let's make it much smaller. Think about it like something like, oh, you know, 1,500 square foot single family house. Maybe that's a lot easier. Just something a little bit smaller in the scale. Okay, so if we asked you, like, you know, how long is it going to take to go through and build that, and what cost might it be, okay, we can come up with all sorts of different numbers depending upon how you want to approach it. Okay, so let's start, well, yeah, just for anyone, you know, how long do you think it takes to build like a, a little single family home? 
Anyone have any experience? Few months. Few months? That's generally kind of a good guess. Okay. So let's say, oh, maybe if I devise this into, if I thought of this, I'll say these are months. That's six months, that's 12 months over here. So let's say, oh, I'm gonna put it on like about four months, something like that. Okay, about, oh, let's just do this in terms of dollars per square foot. Maybe that's an easier way to look at total dollar. How much, how many dollars per square foot do you think it takes to build a single family home? 25. What's that? 25. I want you, I want you to build my house. That'd be great. <laughs> <laughs> I just uh, call and jump up. That'd be a good one. No, it's, uh, that'd be a really good one. In this area, it, conventional wisdom a couple years ago was around $200 a square foot. Wow. It's very complicated here, especially in this area. It's the, it's sort of what the market will bear. It's probably four or $500 a square foot. You know, whatever it is. It's, it's pretty expensive to build around here. So there's some number. I can sort of come up with a point. Let's say it's at four and it's at 200. Okay. Let's see how aggressive you guys are. Does anyone think we could build a single family house in a month? Ah, <laughs> she's on to something interesting. Tell me about this. Uh, well, if you subtract the schedule and you increase the cost because you're having people work overtime, you're um, spending a lot more to have like everything available sooner yeah. when you need it, oh. people at work. Exactly. So what if we tried to bring it back to two months? Do you think it would cost twice as much or what do you think would happen? What do you think? I got Last year cost more than 3,000. Well, ah, you're onto a whole nother strategy there. We could just kind of change our strategy, which is good to think about, because maybe we need to sort of change the way we think about the problem. Let's say we're staying conventional. If it was two months, do you think it costs twice as much, less than twice as much, more than twice as much? Generally, you'd sort of assume that there's some raw cost of materials, the labor and the equipment, all that would be much higher. But the cost of materials would probably stay the same. Mm -hmm. Unless we had to like, pay a whole lot more to get things on site. So, I don't know, maybe it's up in here. Do you think we could build it in one month? Some people do that. Have you ever seen like these fantastic videos of people building entire high rises in like a day? It's pretty amazing. Yeah, it's doable. Yeah, again, there's some value with doing that. And what tends to happen is there's some costs that are fixed, some are variable, blah, blah, blah. You know, so you end up with some sort of curve in here. Okay, how about if I gave you six months to build a house as opposed to four months, you know, would it be cheaper? Maybe yes, maybe no. Yeah, on God says no, anyone say yes? So sometimes it's yes, because, oh, you know, if, if, if you have time on your side, sometimes you can wait for the sale or you can kind of delay till someone has a slow time in their work schedule. Yeah, you can sometimes get some efficiency out of that. So it's somewhere in here, but maybe it's not so good. Okay, how about if I gave you 12 months or even two years? Okay, what, what's sort of the minimum? It's out here somewhere. What's that? Well, oh, maybe it would. Because now you're on something else. Because at that point, just your overhead costs and the trailer and the equipment and all that stuff is starting to add up. And maybe that's starting to be more than the cost of the house. So that'd be that's especially bad if you have something that you know comes back up again. Okay, but let's go ahead and just draw this curve for a second. So I'm, I'm thinking of something like this. OK. So theoretically, this curve is called the Pareto frontier. Like any of these things are, opt are available solutions. I could build it here. I could build it here. I could build it there. I could build it at any of these different points, theoretically, you know, when you think of that. So 
If that is the case at some level, depending upon how much I care about my money versus time, okay, I could be end up anywhere on there and still be kind of okay. Now, this only considers a couple of different factors. If I threw in some other things like, oh, the cost to the poor people who are waiting to move into the house or the rent they're continuing to pay on some other piece of property, that sort of throw another dimension in it or for us in construction, so much as oh, as you're doing a manufacturing facility, the cost of actually, you know, delaying the opening of the production facility another month or six months is huge. It could be millions of dollars, more than the whole cost cost of building the uh, the facility. So other factors that go into it, but theoretically, there's some sort of curve, and here's how it sort of works. If those are all equal. If, on the other hand, for four months, Dom's going to build my house down here, okay, you know, run, don't walk to this solution because uh, this is an incredibly attractive solution, okay? Whereas, oh, Andrew, on the other hand, was bidding somewhere up in here, okay, you know, we don't need to go with him in terms of what's going on. So there's just this frontier, just be aware of it. So whenever we get to multi-dimensional things, there's sort of a trade-off between different things. Yeah, that's sort of what it works. Okay, and that'll come in much more important as we get further into the class because we're gonna learn to evaluate all our designs and on um, several different criteria. And then really what's the best design? Kind of depends on how you prioritize and rank the different criteria. Okay, and it's not always kind of simple trade-offs. If I throw a third variable in here, it's gonna get really hard. But that's okay. That's just kind of where we are today. Okay. As we go moving through and thinking about parametric design, one thing I want to keep you aware of is there's sort of a notion, oh, it's almost like a hierarchy to what we're doing. And that's actually where we're going to start structuring the course. As we think about where we, how we start to approach this, and we can start to use automation to help us with parametric design, there's different levels of getting into things or you know, how it can assist us. At one level, there's this notion of design assistance. Actually, let me switch over to the roadmap. That'll be easier. This is as close as I'm gonna get to a syllabus today. <coughs> We're gonna start by looking at just the whole notion of just how we can go through and use parametric design and some automation to just assist in our designs. So by assisting in our designs, I mean, this is where we're going to go through and use the automation to help us with the design, as opposed to doing everything manually, one step at a time in Revit, and placing every individual item uniquely to actually use a little bit of automation to place things automatically, size things automatically. Yeah. Now, for a lot of our buildings that we've been working on in some of the prior classes, if buildings have very regular forms, this isn't nearly as important because they're very repetitive and you can sort of just copy and paste and do whatever you're doing. But if we start thinking about things that have unusual organic forms, shapes that have to be rationalized, or things where we want them to actually respond to the environment, where it's almost like mass customization, you want to have a lot of things that vary just a little to really be optimized for the specific conditions. Yeah. The whole notion of using automation to assist with the design, to give us a little helping hand, a little boost, is kind of really powerful. So we're going to start with that, looking at parametric components and something called adaptive components. I'll show you a little bit later today. But how do we basically enhance <coughs> it by adding a little bit of automation to help us with the building skins and create just building elements that are responsive? So we kind of like buildings to be a little more responsive. It's kind of disappointing how static they are in the way we design them. But if they can actually respond to the environment, if they can respond to the sun, if they could respond to how we actually use the building dynamically, that'd be a much more interesting organism. I'm a big fan of buildings that sort of are more responsive to what goes on. So we're going to start with design assistance. <coughs> we're then going to move into what I'll call like design evaluation and verification. And that is, once we've gotten the hang of basically using Revit to create, or Dynamo and some of the tools to create some design alternatives, then you've got to evaluate them. And we can evaluate them against sort of static criteria, things like doing code checking, seeing if all our members are meet certain structural requirements, if our doors have the appropriate swings, if our pathways have the appropriate clearances for ADA compliance. We can set up and use design automation to kind of validate our designs. We can also evaluate them. 
So we can sort of rate all these different design alternatives and say, okay, you know, that's just a 99 out of 100. This is a 98. Oh, that's 105. We can really go through and rank them all based on a lot of different criteria. So we're going to learn how we can actually go through and once we've created a series of different alternatives, how we evaluate them and compute rankings for them. Then we really get into the whole notion of just really design optimization. And optimization is really, given that you have a bunch of alternatives and you can rank them, how do you move around through this almost infinite design space to figure out where you want to be? Okay. There's a lot of different kind of cool strategies for dealing with that. At some level, trying to compute every alternative, if I gave you 10 different variables and you had a range of values for each of those 10 different variables, you might have millions of different options. Okay, and rather than trying to compute millions of different options, there's some really cool strategies for narrowing in and zooming in on the ones that look the most productive based on what your criteria are, and using that to get some feedback. So that's where we're going to go in the third part. For the final part, we're going to actually do a little bit of automating of our design workflows. So we're going to talk about really just transferring and exchanging data and using some tools like that. So very often in our world today, we don't stick strictly within Revit or any one tool. You have structural tools, you have building modeling tools, you have energy analysis tools, you have spreadsheets, you have estimating tools, and just getting all your data to flow back and forth between those different things so you can get the feedback without a whole lot of grunge is really important. So that's where we're headed. Uh, we'll also do a little bit of custom programming with Revit. So if you've always thought to yourself that, boy, Revit's kind of OK, but I wish that it could and fill in whatever you wanted, yeah, you'll, you'll get a chance to build your very little Revit plugin, okay? which is actually uh, yeah, kind of fun. As soon as you open the door to that, you are unstoppable. Okay, So uh, that's where we're heading next. Okay. In terms of just, oh, applications, why don't we start with the whole framework? I want you to start thinking about the world in this way. As we start making our design decisions, there are variables, things that are available to you to change that you're willing to put on the table and let vary. And you can think about those inputs or sliders or however you want to think about it. Those are things that are on the table to be changed. There's also a world of constraints. Constraints are things where there's a boundary condition. There are things that you just can't change. It's not an infinite space. There are some constraints. And whether it's some structural requirements or code requirements you're up against, or you have an absolute cost, or just because you're building a building in a specific region now, a region that you only have one choice of a structural system, there, there are different places where we bound ourselves because your world isn't truly infinite. Then we have all these evaluators. Okay, and, you know, other words would be assessments, results, ratings, but for every variable we can tweak, as long as we work within the constraints and ultimately evaluate, okay, we got a little framework for figuring out like how to navigate around in here and find the best spaces to be. And that's what we're going to spend our time doing. Okay, in terms of some examples, we talked a little about time versus cost. That's kind of good. I'm just kind of trying to apply that to an ever popular one, planning a trip. Because that's a really good example. Yeah, have you ever thought about when you're making reservations or you're planning a trip to go somewhere, how many different options you have? It's really pretty amazing whether you're sort of driving up to San Francisco or taking the train up to San Francisco or taking a bus up to San Francisco or, you know, there's a lot of options or I'm just about to, I'm going to be heading down to Walt Disney World next weekend, so I got to plan a trip. Okay, and it's amazing, like, how much is available to you there. But let's kind of just think about it in terms of this framework. Okay, if I'm planning my trip, okay, so let's think about, you know, okay, what are the variables and what are the constraints and how I'm gonna evaluate this, if I can spell that properly. Okay, here's some things I do know. I have to be down there next Friday morning. <coughs> okay there by Friday morning. And I know that I have to be here by Monday night. Actually, Tuesday morning, if I really want to get up close. OK, but those are what I call boundary conditions. Beyond that, how I sort of plan this trip is really, you know, 
kind of variable? Can look that up. Okay, what are my variables? Here we are. Basically, I have to give myself to Florida, so what are some of the variables available to me? It has three Okay, so I have, you could say like my transport mode. Okay, and what would be examples there? Excellent. <laughs> and this is actually good. I'm glad you're hitting this direction because it kind of gets down God's point. Often we doom ourselves to a bad solution space by just limiting ourselves. And yeah, why not vote? There might be some super hydrofoil. <laughs> you know, uh, what is it? Oh, what's the, uh, the hyperloop? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> or uh, my era popular. Yeah, this would just sort of, it would change the world. The transporter. <laughs> you have to get stuck. Well, <laughs> just beam me over. Okay. Uh, what are some of my other variables? Okay. Yes. Oh, Good. Okay, let's see. Is that a variable that's going to be if, if, um, entering into my design, or is what is that sort of? Let's, let's think. That's a good one. So let's think where it fits. Okay, how do how do the climate conditions fit into things? Well, I was thinking that if there was a storm like we're in, we would get from LA to San Francisco in time, or uh, yeah, I'm going to put that in here. I'm going to put that over here. Because that could create a constraint. You know, if there's a storm and the rain's kind of preventing something or other, or a snowstorm on the East Coast or something like that. Actually, it's a really good one as an example because the decision I make today may change radically if tomorrow some big polar vortex comes blowing in and like half the airports across the East Coast <laughs> close or something like that. I might have to remake it, make a new decision really, really quickly in terms of what's going on. Okay. Yeah, exactly. It's not it's a variable like for me. To, ex exactly. See, it's affecting the model, but it's not really something that's, yeah, it's in the model, but it's not, it's not one of the sliders. Okay, so how about, oh, I always think about what airport I'm gonna leave from. That kind of makes a difference, because we've got some choices here. But wouldn't that go under plane? Say again? Departure. If, if you, your plane's departure, wouldn't that, Oh, exactly. Oh, well, actually, you know, that would actually, if it's, whether it's an airport yeah. or a train station. Oh, no, exactly. It's, I, I can see that as being sort of a hierarchical piece of it. Oh. Okay, so based <laughs> on if I was going the plane, okay, no, you're right. That's sort of a hierarchy thing. Okay, I'm going to start heading down the plane just to keep our space so small. But no, that, you're absolutely correct. It's sort of, it's, it's subordinate to that. Okay, what else? I, well, I'm running a half marathon, <laughs> but what you which, but yeah, is it, is it relevant? Maybe not. I mean, it is, it is uh, Oh, actually it does. Yeah, I can see it well. Yeah. It, it, it is, a lot of factors that get affected by that, right? If you okay. go into the, the Disney world, you probably want to uh, get to bed early in the morning, yeah. but if you're just going to relax and chill at the resort, then you can be just like, Okay. Or you might need your car to get around. Get Let me try this. Terrible. So. I'm going to say that one. I'm going to put it as an evaluator. Could, uh, impact on my state of being <laughs> yeah. yep. is going to be one of the ways I'm going to look at this. Actually, uh, you know, oh, and then da, 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 da. even another evaluator is uh, <coughs> continuing use of transport. Yeah, because if I took the car, although it might be very painful and take a lot of time, the fact that I do have the car down there could be an offsetting factor. Okay. That's going to sort of change the way I think about that. Uh, there's this great site, Hitmonk, that I, yeah, if you ever play with it, 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 it's like a pain factor or something like that, where, yeah, as I'm going from here to Florida, you know, I can go for the, you know, five hour flight, I can go for the 15 hour flight. <laughs> You know, there's a lot of different ways of doing it, and yeah, that might be a way that they suggest you can evaluate things. 
Okay, up here. Oh, what else do I have? I actually have sort of this whole notion of departure time. I could even say return time. Actually, let's do this. Let's make this real. <laughs> I felt like, like one of those bad commercials where they show the guy like surfing for his flights in class. <laughs> okay. So well, here's a variable. There's a slider for me to put in. So it's going to be SFO or maybe include nearby. Those are variables. Okay, I can decide whether I want to go straight to that specific one, go somewhere different. These again look like inputs. These are variables. This thing's going to actually go through and do some searching and hopefully try to optimize things for me. So great, looks like my departure time is kind of an interesting thing. What's that? That's my return time, super, we're coming over there. Ooh, here's kind of an interesting thing. Yeah. Do I want to be economy or first class or something like that? So these are all variables. These are things I'm choosing. Okay. Based on that, I'm a student. I like that. Does that make a difference? Okay. It's search the space. Okay. How do I decide? Stop. Does anyone want to go more than two stops? No. <laughs> okay. Okay. So basically, I'm going to introduce a boundary condition. That's going to eliminate things from my uh, solution space. Super. Okay. Um, I have these different airports. If I don't want to fly out of Oakland or Sonoma County, again, I'm introducing a boundary condition. I'm removing things from the space. Okay. By saying that I, I'm not going to consider those alternatives. Okay. I got these prices in here. So, okay, so if price is my only criteria, looks like I found a nice $321 deal, that's not looking too bad. How about, well, how am I gonna decide now? What, what else should I consider? The time, we have a constraint on the time that you need to arrive and get back. Okay, yeah. so I can change these. Again, that's gonna introduce a boundary condition. That's either gonna add or subtract things from my space. Got it. How about if I say, oh, all those times are relatively equal in terms of that. Yeah. How do I choose between, you know, is this six o'clock flight any better than this six o'clock flight? They're only about the same. How do I sort of choose between those? Well, the departure the same, but to come back. Ah, so if I said, Dominic, I got this fantastic deal right here, I'm gonna put you on this flight. So I'm gonna put you on this flight that gets back at 1021 versus this flight over here that gets back at 1220. And that's actually kind of an interesting trade-off. Okay, so here you're gonna get back just after midnight. Here you're gonna get back at 1021 in the evening. Do you have a preference for those two? Well, one is eight hours and 22 minutes and the other is 11 hours. Ah, so there's a trade-off yeah. in here because I can get back at a more reasonable time because if I have to have someone in my family come pick me up, they might prefer 1021. Yeah. Versus, but that's gonna take 11 hours. So again, not gonna belabor it, but it's sort of this whole weird decision maker framework. Think about all these, you know, what your variables are you have to play, what your boundary conditions are, and then how you're evaluating. And we're all gonna evaluate differently. Because you know, given the same trade-off for the same price, these are all kind of about the same. You know, if you're down in here and you're paying for that $467 flight, you're saying, you know, why did you do that? What's so attractive about that? And whether it's that you like the airline, that was one of your boundary constraints because you sort of have a favorable you know, mileage relationship with them, you know, or you like the timing. So there's reasons we go to what appear to be not quite optimal places. Okay, but it's all just in how you evaluate it. Okay, enough of all that. Let's come back to you. So there's variables, there's constraints, there's evaluators. We're going to learn to start thinking about everything in terms of those concerns. And watch out, not to get confused by those things. Because sometimes what you think is a variable is actually a constraint. And you just have to kind of think about it the right way. Okay. 
If we were designing a building form, the same sort of thing would happen. If I gave you a specific site, a plot of land here in Palo Alto or in San Francisco, and I said, I need you to build me 100,000 square feet of office building. That's your requirement. But what you're going to do, you know, now has, there's, there's variables. Let's kind of think about that. So if I said, again, variables, uh, constraints, evaluators. It's interesting. I would almost say that the requirements almost sort of fall into the same category here, because as I think about it, the fact that I'm going to give you this requirement to give me this 100,000 square feet, yeah. That's just something I need. Maybe that's a minimum. It could be the maximum. It could be an absolute. I don't know. If it has to be in San Francisco, you know, or I'm giving you a specific site, okay, that would be a constraint also. If I just said it has to be in San Francisco, that'd give you a little more freedom in your design space. It might lead you a different thing. Yeah. What kind of variables do you have available to you as you're designing some just building form? What are some of the big level ones? Yeah. Excellent. So the height, the orientation. Construction method. Excellent, good. Windows. Is programming constraint? Actually, it is. I would sort of say that the program that you're trying to meet is a constraint. Although it's interesting because you might have a little bit of flexibility if you could provide, you know, oh, you know, 100 offices at 200 square feet or a certain amount of open office, that might become a variable. But the fact that you have to provide a certain amount of office is a constraint. Yeah. Okay. Evaluating is where the story gets interesting. So how do we evaluate this form? And this is going to come out, we're all going to come at it for different ways. So if you are thinking about it as the energy consultant, on God, what would you think about, you know, what would you want to know? How would you evaluate my design? Okay, anything else? That's kind of your biggest. <laughs> Got it. Okay, <laughs> who's, my, who's my contractor? Who's my constructor? Do we have any constructors in the group? No, oh, what, a con what do you think contractors care about? Time required and cost. Time and cost. Okay, do I have structural engineers in the crowd? Okay, so as a structural engineer, what are you going to think about as I give you several different designs to think about? What, what are you going to be looking at to, as you try and say what looks a good, like a good design versus a bad design? Drift. Ah, drift is a very good one. Especially if this thing gets tall. Okay, very good. Anything else? Say again? It. Okay, and ha do you have any architects in the crowd? I think I have a couple. E any ideas? Uh, how are you going to consider this? What would be the, some of the top things on your criteria? If I put two <laughs> buildings in front of you, what are you thinking? Um, Anything in there? You like to double click down into things. What are a couple facets <laughs> in user experience? <laughs> um, I don't know. Good. Suggestions? Andrew? Uh, no? Well, I guess I would focus on the energy side where you have user comfort. Yeah. In there. Actually, user comfort's a piece uh, of it. It sort of is related to the whole EI. That's sort of the way they can kind of come together. So, sometimes we look at views or lighting. Um, amount of walking you have to do might be a consideration too. Ooh. The bathroom is the opposite side of the building from your desk. Maybe you don't like it as much. Let's say the walkability. Yeah, there's all these different things. You know, we can come up with any number of criteria, and ultimately we would like to because you know what we'd almost like to do is, as we're designing a building. You know, it'd be really cool to 
sort of as you're designing and thinking about forms, have a little, you know, like dashboard that gives you little ratings on how you're doing on some of these things. So as I go through and I shrink those windows down because I'm trying to help my engineer who's thinking about in energy and the daylighting is being squeezed out of the building and the poor people don't get to see outside anymore, yeah, I'm making a trade-off in there. So you'd like to go ahead and see what those different things are. Consider them all, but there's really, you know, even with this little list of criteria, there's, there's really a whole lot of different things we can do. A, that's a big design space all of a sudden. Okay. You know, on the variable side, you know, maybe all I'm doing is changing the height, the orientation, maybe the shape. Okay, but yeah, a big design space in there. Okay, this is how we're going to start taking apart the problem. Okay, let us do this. Let's go ahead and take our break now. When you come on back from our break now in, oh, let's see if you can get yourself back by 11.30, we will shift our gears and start looking at uh, just actually the specifics of the software and how all the tools start working together. So you get a sense to like, what do we do with all this in terms of actually trying to make it actionable and create systems that let us try and work it out. So let me pause this. Please join us again at 1130.